Well, good morning all, and we're delighted for those on the internet who can join us, and thank you, brothers and sisters, for coming this morning, and we're going to have fellowship with you and worship God together. I need to say that um, I borrowed some from different places. I've used some from here and a bit from there. As Pastor would say, I've taken my milk from many places, but God has made it into the butter, and some of it is through the Lord teaching me in 30 years of walking with him. So I give him all the glory. My first scripture reading is Matthew 11, 28 to 29. If you've got a Bible, you can have a look at it. That's Matthew 11, 28 to 29. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I've been talking to a couple of people this morning already. They're telling me that they're burdened with unanswered prayer, burdened with the things they're going through. So God does not want you to be burdened, because he says, cast all your cares upon me, as I care for you. He wants you to come into that place of rest. This word is for those who are discouraged, those who feel that they've been um, rejected, hurt, those who are feeling that they're burnt out, those that have given out and um, are tired, and for those who are eager and hungry and say there must be more than this. This is a message for you today. I want to start with them. A lovely little thing. And I just encourage you, um, because we're going to talk about getting in your Bible later, but Our Daily Bread and Word for the Day, UBC, wonderful tools to to spend time with God, wonderful tools to to find portions of Scripture to read. It's called, um, it's on Wednesday the 14th, The Rhythms of Grace. And as I read it, I just wonder if, if this is you. A friend and his wife, now in the early 90s, married for 60 years, wrote their family history for their children, grandchildren, and generations to come. The final chapter, a letter from mum and dad, contains important life lessons they learned. One caused me to pause and take inventory of my own life. There's a good point. Take an inventory. If you find that Christianity exhausts you, drains you of your energy, then you're practicing religion, rather enjoying a relationship with Jesus Christ. Your walk with the Lord will not make you weary, it'll invigorate you, restore your strength and energize your life, for he promised to give you abundant new life. E. June Peterson paraphrases Jesus' invitation in this passage as, are you tired? Worn out, burnt out on religion. Walk with me and work with me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. For it's by grace that we walk and we serve and we minister. And when I think that serving God is all up to me, I begun to work I begun working for him instead of walking with him. There is a vital difference. I'm not If I'm not walking with Christ, my spirit becomes dry and brittle. People are annoyances. I think that rings a bit true. Not fellow human created in God's image, and nothing seems right. When I sense that I'm practicing religion instead of enjoying a relationship with Jesus, it's time to lay the burden down and walk with him in his unforced rhythms of grace. Lord, I come to you today and exchange my frenzied work for your pathway of grace. Amen. What a beautiful word. You know, we're saved by grace, not by works. And it's by grace that we serve him.
I'd like to read uh, Matthew. Matthew 14. Really speaking, it's, it's all of that. We talked about John the Baptist and feeding the 5,000. But the portion I want to speak about today is Jesus walks on the sea, which is verse 22, Matthew 14, 22. And we'll be going into a little bit of background before that. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And then he, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when the evening had came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous and he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you little face, why did you doubt? And this is a portion that the Lord has highlighted for me. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. We're going to be talking about worshipping the Lord. That's what he's been revealing to me. But I just want to go back a little bit. We're Mark 6, 1 to 6, where Jesus goes to Nazareth and uh, he's rejected by his own people. And uh, they say in verse 3, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? He didn't say he was the son of Joseph, which was what the Jewish religion was. He said, is this the son of Mary? We know he's born out of wedlock. So they were offended by him. Yet they were astonished, saying, when did this man get these things? Or where did, this, where did the man, this man get these things? And what wisdom is this that is given to him? That such mighty works are performed by his hands. Jesus came to his own. It's nothing like coming home and expecting to be accepted, but he was rejected. You see those people, they acknowledged all the mighty works that they'd done, and really speaking, that was a sign that they should have, they should have looked and realized and recognized who he was, but they were looking in the flesh, as so often we do, and they were looking in the flesh and they seen a man, and he said, is this not the carpenter, Mary's son? We know him. You see, they needed to look with spiritual eyes and they would have seen truly that he was the Son of God. Then they would have worshipped him as God intended. Then they would have accepted their Messiah. And you know, it's only when people see Jesus with spiritual eyes and see him as the Son of God and fall down and worship him that the hearts are changed. It's only when this nation sees Jesus Christ for who he is and bow down and worship him that this nation will change. But God will change it one person at a time. Politicians won't change it. Uh, ide ideologies won't change it. Um, God will change this nation one person at a time. And he starts with you and I. And you know, um, as an early Christian, I worked in the steelworks as a bricklayer. And um, for quite a number of years, they probably 10, I don't know, they'd, they'd seen me as the old Kenny Morrow, particularly a right out there, a right character, um, always wanting to joke about, and, and every, other swear word, every other word was a swear word. And um, then I got saved, gloriously saved. Uh, 
in some ways I would describe it as I had a soul experience with God. I was totally changed and uh, overnight my swearing stopped. I one day was witnessing to them because I thought it was just the three steps to God, recognize as God, recognize you're a sinner, and God can forgive you and just receive it by grace, and that was it. But you see, they have to know Jesus. And so I shared, and they came back with, oh, we remember you, we remember what you used to be like, we remember the things you said. Oh, you can't talk to us, we know what you were like. And I went away disheartened, and I said, Lord, I didn't really do a good job of that. And he did say I didn't do a good job, because he was happy that he confessed him before men. And Jesus said, I'll confess him before my Father in heaven, who's confessed me. But he said, you know what? He said, Ken, they choose to look at the old life rather than the new. They choose to look at what was and not is. And you know why? Because if they, could, if they recognize the change, the, the transformation at, and the new life and the new creation I've made you into, then they've got to recognize and acknowledge there's a God. And they have to change, but they don't want to. So they'd rather look at the dead. And this is what it was like when Jesus went to Nazareth and he went into the temples and whatnot. They looked at the old life. They didn't see, you know, they, they looked at, he's a carpenter. And so they looked at him in the flesh. But later on, in the, it says that, 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 that I knew Jesus in the flesh, now I know him by the Spirit. What a wonderful thing to do. You see, they weren't willing to surrender their lives and let Jesus rule in their heart. I done that. What a glorious day that was. They said, it's only Jesus. You know, if you're working and you're discouraged and you're not seeing much fruit, let me tell you, I, I did door knocking for quite a while and the Lord said to me, I said, Lord, where's the fruit? I don't see anyone getting saved. He said, did I say there would be fruit? What did I ask you to do? I said, you asked me to go out and knock the doors. He said, did you do it? I said, yes. Were you obedient? Yes, he said. Well then, You've been obedient, the blessing will follow. Well, praise the Lord. Laura came through some of our door work. We, we sowed a seed in there and God developed it. But then, that was good. But you have to be obedient. First obedient, then the blessing. And if you're feeling discouraged, don't look for the fruit. Just know that you've been obedient. And you know, some people will say, it's only Kenny Morrow. Take no notice. It's only, whoever your name is. <laughs> <laughs> it's only Brenda. <laughs> it's only it's only Gareth. I remember what he was like. Take no notice. And God uses someone like me. The foolish things of the world are confound the wise. Praise him. Amen. You know, Mark six verse four to five it says a prophet is is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives and in his own house. Even in his own house, he is without honor. You know, and um, I really believe that God is saying, I want you to step out this morning. I really believe there's a challenge on people's lives this morning. God says, I want you to get out the boat. I want you to get out of the comfort zone. I want you to get out, and I want you to go for me. And I'll tell you why, because, you know, um, It's in going that God equips you, He anoints you, He puts a call on your life, and He opens the doors for you. And I know that when I was an apprentice bricklayer, two good bits of advice. And um, one was keep your mouth shut and your ears open, and you'll do well. Wonderful advice. The person saying it to me said, Look, I know how to lay bricks, you don't. So don't chops to me when I talk to you. Just listen and you learn. A bit blunt, but it was good. And the other one was, he said, when you finish your time, see that when you finish your time, you had faith in me. When you finish your time, your apprenticeship, and you've learned your trade, move from this firm. Go to somewhere else. Don't stay where you trained you. I'm not saying God is saying, leave your church where you've grown up into. But, you know, some, you have to go out. You have to go out, even go out on a mission. Go out and, and, and get involved outside because um, it's only as you go that you know. 
And we had a, a, we had a speaker come from Poland, and she came for the weekend and came for the Sunday, and she said, you know what, she said, I never knew the power, I never knew the anointing God had put on, in me and on me until I came. You know? You know, when, when people go abroad, people have a great expectation of you. But when you come to preach, say, oh, I'd rather have a visit and preach or pray. Uh, I know you. Yeah. It's, it's God that does it, not... We need... And, and, and also we say, I'm not coming to that speaker. I don't like them. You know, well, yeah. it's God that's speaking, yeah. not the speaker. And who's to say that God hasn't brought you there that morning to minister to someone? We still got to stop looking in the flesh, church, and we need to rise up. But I'm saying, God is saying, prayerfully ask him, Lord, what do you want to do? I, I took a team on mission. And I took them because I wanted them to, uh, to go to Poland, to minister a minority group. I wanted them to realize what they had in them. They didn't know what they had until they stepped out. So pray. Speak with your leaders. Even if you go on mission and carry someone's Bible, God will use it. And God is no man's debtor. He will reward you. Because first is the obedience, then the blessing. Let God open the doors. Don't you open them. A wonderful bit of advice I had for those on the front line. Look to God to encourage you, not man. It's a great healing that I've had in my life because I've suffered rejection. That when people suffer rejection and hurt, they, they want to be affirmed. They want other people to build up their confidence. But you know, if you keep looking for someone to affirm what you're doing, saying it's all right, the enemy will know your weakness and you bring someone along, often someone quite close, and they will give a half-truth. They won't know they're being used by the enemy. They may only be joking, but you know, it, it will pierce your heart. And you know, the enemy will give a half a truth and twist it and so that you'll receive it and you'll get discouraged and disappointed. So much so to the point of giving up. If that's you today, don't give up. Don't listen to those lies. You know, each morning, put on, put on Christ Jesus and make no provision for the flesh. What does that mean? I put on Christ Jesus, I put on a new life, I put on the mind of Christ, and if it doesn't line up my thinking and my walk with the Lord, if it doesn't line up with the Bible, then it's not a God, I chuck it out. And I start quoting scripture over my life, and start believing the promises of God rather than the lies of the enemy. Take that on board. It's good to have encouragement, yes, but look to the Lord, he will affirm you, because he's called you. Remember, your confidence is in God, not in your ability. And the only ability God wants is your availability. I know it's old, but it's very good. So be like David. When David had 400 men and they just lost all their families and their possessions, they wanted to kill him. David was in the cave going, woe is me, into a pity party. And then he realized that no one else was going to encourage him. So he... He stirred himself up and he encouraged himself. Stir yourself up. Encourage yourself when the enemy comes against you. Do likewise. You know, God has invested so much in you. I say it's only Kenny Morrow. It's only whatever her name is. But, <laughs> but, excuse me, but you're an individual. You have to love yourself. God has invested so much in you that the enemy is out to kill you. I should have been dead at least eight times, but the Lord has saved me and he saved me for a grand purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14, I know the plans I have for you. Plans for peace, plans for prosperity, plans for a future, not calamity. You will seek me, you will find me, and I will be found by you, and I will bring you from all the places you've been scattered. I will make you whole. I will make you complete. I will bring you back from all the places that the enemy in the world has shattered you in. And I, all, that, all the fractured parts, I'll make whole when you seek him. That's the plan God has you, not what the enemy tells you. He marveled at their unbelief in that town. You know, there's no other place in the Bible that say Jesus marveled at anything, but he marveled at their unbelief. How they could not believe in who he was, seeing and knowing what he was, was doing.
cover yourself with the blood each day, put on the armor of Christ, know that you're in a war. You know, I'm talking about background because I'm coming to the walking on water, but I believe the Lord wants to talk to you about this really to get you to a point where he can I'm testifying so that you can be ready to witness to what God wants to do and to move forward. Mark 6, 14 to 29. John, had, uh, the, John the Baptist beheaded. It was, um, actually, fact, I think I missed a little bit, where, is where, the 70, where the 12 went out and ministered. They went out and ministered, and they came back rejoicing. Uh, but it was when the 72 came back and he said, even demons have fleed from us and people were healed. He said, don't rejoice in what you do, but rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The foundation and the rock that you stand on, you minister from, is not what you do, not who you are, it's what God sees you as. And he, you know, um, just lost that little thread of it, is that you're saved. And in times of trouble, remember that you're saved. Remember what it's like to be unsaved? It was hell. But God has saved you. Have a heart of gratitude. In the midst of the torment, start praising God. Start, start the steps. Gratitude, thanksgiving, praise. Then into worship, into his presence. Stir yourself up. Well, after the, seven, after the 12 had come back, John heard all about it, and uh, uh, Herod had heard all about it, and John had confronted Herod about uh, Marian Herodotus. That's how I say it anyway. And um, that was his brother's wife, Philip's wife. And he had persuaded her to divorce Philip and marry him. Uh, and he was her uncle. And, um, you know, sin is never done alone. Sin has consequences. Sin isn't just about yourself and hidden. It affects other people. And it has consequences. You know, Herod later lost his kingdom because the king of his first wife, the, the princess that he'd married, came against him because he divorced her. And then his brother Philip, he went to Caesar and accused him of treason. So him and his wife, Herod and his wife, were exiled to Gaul, where they committed suicide. I don't think that would ever have happened if, if Herod had not lusted and coveted someone else's wife. Oh. I got something. I'm just going to introduce it now. When you love what you have, you have everything you need. You know, Herod was unhappy with what he had. He coveted something else. And Paul says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Start giving thanks for what you have. Start loving what you have. Then you have everything you need. When you start looking for what your neighbor has or keeping up with your neighbor, you're following the world system and you get discontent and leads to sin. But if you are struggling with sin today, let, it, let me tell you that not only does your relationship with your brothers and sisters uh, affect, get affected, not only does your relationship with your close friends get affected, but your relationship with God um, gets affected. You still have a relationship with God, but your fellowship will stop. You'll stop coming to church. You'll stop wanting to be around God's people. You'll just stop wanting to pray and get in the Word. You'll stop wanting to worship God. If you're battling with sin today, the way to start afresh is only a prayer way. Pray, repent, and confess. Because it says in 1 John 1 verse 9, God is just and true. If we confess our sins, he will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a promise. God will not reject you. If we come to the bit that the Lord had given me, Matthew 13, Matthew 14, verses 13 to 21. And Herod had beheaded John. And then the disciples, you know, the disciples came and told Jesus. And when it says verse 13, 
When Jesus heard it, he departed there by boat to a deserted place by himself, by himself alone. You know, he was rejected by his own people. He's rejected by the political leaders. He was rejected by the religious leader, much like God's churches. But hallelujah, the multitudes came and clambered after Jesus. Why? Because he had life. He had the words of life. And Jesus had come away because he didn't want to be acclaimed as king, an earthly king. He didn't want to um, uh, be near Herod because his time had not come. And he could have been angry and he could have been bitter and he came because he was mourning for his cousin. But when the crowds turned up, he wasn't angry, he wasn't bitter. He had compassion upon them. What a wonderful gift compassion is. It says in the Bible six times that compassion moved Jesus to minister and do miracles and healing. And you know, I'm saying to you this morning, when you're serving the Lord, often comes a point when you're tired, when you're hurting, when you probably had bad news. In the midst of your pain and suffering, someone comes to you and says, I got this problem. You know, God still calls you to minister through your pain and your suffering. And in ministering to others, laying aside your pain, sacrificing that and giving it to God, God will minister to you. Jesus set the way for us to go. And he healed all the sick that came. And you know what? He didn't just do a, a, a little episode and said, I've done my bit. He went all through the day to the evening. Compassion is a wonderful thing. It enables us to give sac sacrificially of ourselves. We need to be praying. We need to be praying that our hearts will be kept tender towards people and not be offended by people. If offense comes to say, I know where it's coming from, I know what the enemy's doing, I'm not receiving it, go. Don't let it land on you. And just say, bless them, Lord. You know what? You walk free. But if you let it go in there, it'll pull you down. It'll be like a chain, like a millstone around your neck. Don't be offended. Jesus didn't get offended. Bless them instead. I want to say to you that there was a pastor's wife a busy Sunday afternoon at home, resting up, ready for the evening. And the phone went. And, she said, and her husband went down and she said, excuse me a minute. I hope that's not another one of your congregation wanting you again. You know, as soon as the words were out of her mouth, she felt conviction. She knew that she was cold-hearted. She knew that she was burned out. She knew that she was not tender, loving, and Christ-like towards them. And she may have had a reason, because, you know, frontline ministry is not easy. But God will equip you. And right there and then she cried out to God and said, God, I need revival. I need revival. Revive me, Lord. Start with me. And how did she start that? With repentance and, and confession. Asking for forgiveness. Bearing a heart. You know, confession is only agreeing with God that we've fallen short. He knows all about it. We just say, Lord, I agree with you. I've sinned. Forgive me. You've been forgiven. You know? So, but, you know, every time you say, forgive me, Lord, and come and repent, is into the nail in the coffin. If you're struggling with an addiction or an overcoming sin, each time come and say, Lord, forgive me. And, you know, it's like another nail in the coffin. The mark of a mature Christian is how quick they come back to God and say, Lord, forgive me. Not wait three days and say, Lord, and come like a beggar. You're not a beggar, you're a saint. You're a saint kept by grace. Once you were a sinner, not a sinner anymore. You've been redeemed. You're saved. You're a saint kept by grace. Walk by that grace, but don't put upon that grace. God loves you. I need revival. So if you're burnt out and exhausted, cast your cares upon him, take his yoke and walk with him. Spend time in his presence, seeking his face, not his hand. Recognize him for who he is. 
You know, often we come and say, Lord, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for what you've given me. No, Lord, I thank you that you're my Father in heaven. You know, when my children come to me, I want them to say, I thank you that you're the best dad in the world. I thank you for, for who you are, not I thank you for what you give me. And, you know, you know it, it's, it's who we are. And that's how Father wants you to approach him. In Matthew 14, 22 to 33, we read, I had this word and I said, Lord, I've read this, I've heard it so many times, I could switch off, tell me something new about it. This is the revelation I believe he's given me and he wants you to learn and take on board. And I come to the end of my chat shortly. Jesus walks on water. Jesus sent him away in a boat because he knew the, the hearts of the people that they wanted to raise him up as an earthly king. But he sent him away because he wanted to be alone. When the storms of life come and the winds buffet us and the waves, waves overpower us, sometimes we forget that we're called by God to walk in the footsteps that he's led in. Um, um, the prophet Samuel forgot that God told him to anoint David and he was born in the uh, anoint Saul and he was born in the fact that Saul had God had disowned him and, got, and was wanting to get rid of him but it was God that told him to go and anoint him see false responsibility and so he went in the morning and in the end God said how long are you going to mourn how long are you going to mourn for this see I'm raising up a new thing go and anoint a new king you know when we look back and the other thing I want to tell you this morning that God just said, forget the past. Forget in the past, I look forward. The past is covered with the blood. Don't let the enemy bother with you. The, the future is the way ahead. And, and Samuel was so stuck in the past, he was missing God raising up a new king. It's time to stop mourning, church. Your sins are covered with the blood. And we forget that God has called us to go out on the mission field. We forget the call that God has called us to do this work. And then when, when trouble comes, we say, oh, why did I ever? And why is this happening to me? Well, because Satan hates you. And you're doing a really good and effective work. And so it was with the, the ones on the boat. They went out and they, um, they were struggling. But where was Jesus? He was up on the mountain praying. And it says in Mark 4, when I find it, it says in, in Mark 6, verse 48, Now the evening come, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And 48, Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he would have passed by, except they called him. And straight away Jesus said, Be of good cheer, do not but fear, it is I. When you're in the midst of the storm, when you're waiting for an answer for your prayer, Gary, when you're waiting for the answer for your prayer, know that God, Jesus, is praying for you. He's watching you. He's seeing your struggle. Will, he's seeing your struggle. He's praying for you. He was on the mountain. It said in the Bible, Jesus is in heaven interceding for you. He intercedes for us. He's our mediator. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. He hasn't forgotten you. Sometimes God will take you round of a problem. Sometimes he'll take you through it. Other times he'll... Uh, I don't know. Sometimes he'll take you round it. Sometimes he'll take you uh, out of it. No, I, I missed it here somewhere. Uh, where do we go? <laughs> um, let's see where. He'll take you around it. He'll take you through it. And there's another one. Take you out of it. Right, uh, you take you out of it or take you around it. But he may choose to leave you in it. Not, sorry, not leave you in it. Not, this, uh, that's good, isn't it? It's good, because God wants to make a point. He won't leave you in it. He'll take you through it. And why? Because God wants to get all the glory that Satan uh, wanted to pray for. Satan wanted to use it for evil, but God is going to turn around for good. And God will keep you there until such a time that he's extracted all the glory. It may not just be about you, but other people watching how you are. But God will take you through it. And you know what? He says, when he's got all the glory, he will deliver you. But also, when you're in it, he says, in Psalm 84, I encourage you to read it. You know, 
Uh, as you go through the valley of Baca, you will become springs of living water, and, and the rains will come. And a hue's heart is set on a pilgrimage toward God to go from strength to strength. Psalm 84, I can talk about that. I had a heart attack. I'm in hospital. I pick up my Bible with encouragement, and God says, in the valley of Baca, you become springs of living water. And I didn't know where it was going to go. Later on, I said, Lord, I don't know where you're taking me home. I don't know where I'm going to live or die, but whatever you will, let it be done. So I know, but he said, he whose heart is on a pilgrimage. You know, when you're going through the valley of Baca, God is saying, you will become springs of life. You know, I minister in that situation. How are we ever going to touch people in desperate situations unless sometimes God takes us there? But God had the glory and he turned it all around. You know, almost finished. Peter stepped out the boat. The other stayed in the boat. And you know, we all remember Peter failing and looking at the waves and sinking. But we forget that Jesus took his hand and he said when they came back to the boat, they got in. Jesus didn't carry him in the boat. He walked back on the water. So he, he overcome that fear. And he walked, the very thing, the very storms that um, Satan wanted to do, Peter put under his feet by the power of God. The storms and the waves he walked on, he used it for God's glory. You know, when they got in the boat, this is the bit that um, it was that they fell down and worshipped him. And that's the bit God, why did God allow that to happen? Why did Jesus orchestrate all that? Because they'd seen him in the flesh, they'd, they'd cast out demons, yet they didn't know who he was. Much like the religious people, like the guys in the boat, they know all about him, but they don't know him. It's a relationship. Peter had it, and he walked on water. I just want to briefly finish. I had a dream. I'm at that age. And that dream was, right, that I was in a, wor a workman's club with all long benches and chairs on either side, and um, it was all full, but right opposite us there was a spare seat. And on the seat was a, a, a yellow envelope and a newspaper half over it. And there was some writing on the envelope, and there's a young lad in his 20s by me. And being a young lad inquisitive, he wanted to know what it was. So he moved the paper out the way and he picked up the envelope and he looked at it and this is what he saw. Can you see it? It was a birthday card and on it it says, Jesus loves you. And you know what? He turned around and he said, Dora, look at this, he said, Jesus loves you. Who would want to fill their life with that rubbish? And God took me away from there because he said, don't witness to him. And God said, if you don't fill your life with Jesus, what are you filling it with? I done double glazing. I knocked every door and go in. And I can tell you most of the time those houses were empty. They looked nice on the outside, but they were empty inside. You know, a man can wash himself. He can cut his hair, trim his beard, put on clean clothes. He look great on the outside, but he can be empty inside, spiritually dead. Is that you today? If you don't know Jesus, you never give your life to Jesus, you're missing out an abundant life. Give your life to Jesus today and have abundant new life. But church, it's time for a spring clean. It's time, it's time for you to get rid of the clutter and the distractions in your life. If you want revival, start with you. Be like our pastor's wife. You know what? She prayed and she, and she sought the Lord and he had the worldwide revival church. You know the anointing on them now, they just go like that and half the church falls down. And ministering to nations, and I came out of that Sunday afternoon. If you're fed up and saying there must be more than this, God is saying to me, the way forward is the Word of God. Ask Him to give you love for His Word. In His Word, he, you will discover Jesus, you will discover God's plan for you. And it says, The Word is powerful to cut through to the bone, the marrow, and the soul. It's able to separate the flesh from the spirit, it can transform you. Spend time with the author of the book to get to know the author. Jesus loves you. He really does. And what are you filling your life with? It should be Jesus. Um, let me say, I'm going to finish now. What can I say? What's, what, is this, what is this birthday card that I, that I found as a prop? Well, it says, Go Bananas this birthday. 
and you know I had a t-shirt that color with a thing on with a bunch of bananas and says I'm bananas for the Lord you can't do any better than be bananas for the Lord you know when you're bananas for the Lord every day is a great day so if you're feeling discouraged been rejected one other thing I just need to say briefly is that Jesus gives you value. You've got to get the right image of the Father. You've got the right image of Jesus. Get the right image of yourself. You may feel you're worthless, but God says, I put the value on you. Whatever a person prepared to pay for you determines the value. You're priceless. You're my priceless possession because I sent my son to die for you. God put the price on you and it's priceless because it was paid by Jesus' blood. Value yourself. Love yourself. Come back to God. He loves you. God bless you. Glory to God.